Um, good afternoon for those who are in our uh, European, Central European uh, time zone and uh, hello to everybody. Uh, I'm uh, very pleased to have uh, with us at the Center for Advanced Studies uh, uh, great uh, researchers, but also friends. Um, it's, um, uh, the occasion is actually the, the uh, book Socialist Yugoslavia and the Non-Aligned Movement uh, with the subtitle Social, Cultural, Political and Economic Imaginaries. And I presume that this imaginaries is very important for what we are going to uh, uh, talk about and what we are going to discuss. It's the book that uh, Paul Stubbs edited. And uh, we are having uh, with us also Rade Vekovic, a friend and uh, uh, well, a legend. And uh, also uh, a very, very dear uh, colleague and friend, uh, Piero Regeppi. Uh, Paul uh, will lead uh, the, the presentation, uh, then uh, uh, Rada will uh, take the Zoom screen, and Piero uh, for about 15 minutes, more or less, and uh, we will have plenty of time for discussion and uh, fruitful uh, exchange. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. And uh, the Zoom is yours. Thanks so much. Thanks to the Center for Advanced Studies, to Sanya and to Tina for organizing. Thanks to Rada and Piero for agreeing to do this. I'm not going to embarrass them, but it is like a dream event for me, actually. And somebody, one of the authors of the book, one of the authors of the chapter said to me, aren't you getting tired of these book launches? Because this is kind of technically, I think, the fifth. And I said, look, this is not just another book launch. Uh, what the aim was to do was to use the book. And let me be very clear, the book was never conceived as the first, and it's certainly not the last word on the topic of Socialist Yugoslavia and the non-aligned movement, but to use the book to kind of think through the lens of decoloniality, whatever we might mean by that, to address what the book tells us, and what much more needs to be researched and told about the ambivalences and contradictions of Yugoslavia's enrollment through non-alignment in transnational forms of decolonial solidarity. I'm also grateful this is the second Zoom event because it very much means that authors of the chapters can join in. And I, I saw Mila, Dubravka, Jure and Chiara, there may be more, but hopefully this is a chance for me to speak less and for some of the authors to speak more. Uh, I also want to say a big thanks to the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung office in Southeast Europe. They funded a series of workshops which brought the authors together at an early stage. And McGill Queen's University Press, who were excellent and important and supportive. The book is expensive, but I am told that there are ways of getting hold of it for nothing. Uh, um, look, the 14 chapters in the book, plus my introduction, discuss a very wide range of themes. They deliberately avoid a single narrative. There is no party line here. What I wanted to do in the book was allow a thousand flowers to bloom, to allow diverse approaches, genres, and arguments to emerge, because in that process of emergence, they reveal the contradictions, the contestations, and the complexities of the non-aligned movement itself, socialist Yugoslavia's role within it, and the ambiguous and porous nature of geopolitical categorizations and configurations, right? And what follows in my 10 minutes is just a very provisional, or perhaps I should just say today's take, on questions of contradictory decoloniality. It's in the spirit of opening a dialogue rather than closing down arguments that I want to intervene and say things. Um, let me start by saying it wasn't hard to find 18 authors. Um, and now you could find a lot more who are engaged in what I think is becoming a rapidly expanding area of scholarship. There is work which is breaking down disciplinary barriers work which is breaking down divisions between activism and academia, between cultural workers and people who work in academia. It's even, I think, breaking down distinctions between whether we study top-down diplomacy 
or bottom-up um, movements. And a lot of this is about the complexities of what I call, I think, in the introductory chapter, circuits of decolonial affinity, right? Um, any kind of decolonial sensibility, and I recognize there is not one decolonial approach that we will all share, any decolonial sensibility towards the non-aligned movement has to focus on multiple nodes and trajectories. It has to explore the spaces offered and closed down for meaningful transnational exchanges from below, science, art and culture, architecture, industry, as much as top-down international relations. Huh? And the book was an attempt to overcome the amnesia or selective remembrance of some post yugoslav political elites in the moment of non-alignment. Don't forget, I live in a country where we're not allowed to use the word Yugoslavia. We talk about Bivše Dežava. Um, but it's also not about being nostalgic. It's about being critical and conjunctural. Uh, I realize that what I'm saying has lots of C words in it, and there's more to come, I promise. Um, so let me get to the gist of this. Um, there can be no doubt, I think, that Socialist Yugoslavia was a modernizing project, right? And that indeed, Socialist Yugoslavia brought its own particular stance on modernization into the always already modernizing project of the non aligned movement. You'll be familiar with the tropes of rapid industrialization and urbanization, the modernization of agricultural production, the expansion of education, welfare, and mass literacy. So you've got that modernization on the one hand. But of course, if post-colonial scholarship does anything, it makes us deeply suspicious whenever we hear the M word, right? The word modernization. And it makes us deeply suspicious of the practices that flow from it. And hence, I think the deep ambivalence, I actually am a great fan of ambivalence, I have to say. Um, the great ambivalence about uh, some of the relationships between social Yugoslavia and non-alignment. So it is, I think, the complex relationship between modernity, developmentalism, and economic and political orders and orderings that matter here. Uh, Catherine Baker, in that lovely book um, of hers, Race and the Yugoslav Region, has suggested that, quotes, non-alignment built identification with global anti-colonial struggle into the narrative of Yugoslavia's state identity, but that this was an anti-colonialism that was often race blind and Eurocentric. There were also gaps, I think, between the rhetoric and the reality of this anti-colonialism and between state-sponsored narratives and people's everyday lives, right? Um, understanding the non-aligned movement, for me, has, has to address what Barabzi called the architecture, its architecture of complexity. It has to focus our attention on relationships, flows, and trajectories. And, oh dear, I sound like a born-again historical researcher, but you need forensic, empirical, and historic, historiographical research in which the capacity to be surprised actually matters, okay? I'm very skeptical of the fetishism of the archives and those aha moments, because archives silence or render marginal things which are really important, but there's still, there's a need for forensic empirical research here. There are two, at least, criticisms of the book that I wanna make, the auto-critique, if you like. Uh, one of them I made even before the book was published. Uh, after it was written, but before it was published. And that is the critique of its Eugocentrism, all right? And Eugocentrism is a complex assemblage, but it's, for me, it's when you have a primary focus on Yugoslavia and Yugoslav sources, and maybe even some Yugoslav sources. I'm looking at Piro and thinking about language and, and, and the issue of which language sources are, are being looked at. So I think what's needed is a kind of double movement uh, you need, of course, to bring Yugoslavia back into global historiography, but you also need to decenter its positionality, ensuring that other sites of analysis and struggle and the relationships between them are taken into consideration. So historiography rooted in anti-colonial struggles in the global south, in the three continents of Africa, Asia, and Latin America, is really important in a reconsideration of the significance of non-alignment 
which might also actually mean having to decenter the concept of non-alignment itself, because the, that doesn't have the same resonance in the global south as it did in Yugoslavia or for scholars of uh, socialist Yugoslavia, right? Now, those of you who read my introductory chapter, um, there is there a critique of what I call Yugoslavia's liminal hegemony. You know, they were leading the movement very much in the 60s. They were writing the communiques before the events happened. They were funding a lot of the events, but they were also aware that being situated in Europe they, they, they shouldn't necessarily be leaving, leading. So that ambivalence was run through. But I also commented in that chapter on what I think at times was a deep conservatism amongst the Yugoslav political elite, you know, um, and an attempt to neutralize what I would perhaps see as more radical initiatives. Uh, at the time, and I've got Moisov's book here behind me, he would call them pseudo-radical initiatives. But, you know, Sukarno's idea of the Conference of New Emerging Forces, the Tricontinental in, uh, in Havana, and the stuff that I'm working on now when Algeria kind of pushed the new international economic order. The, the, Yugoslav, elite, the Yugoslav political apparatus was not very supportive of those things. And I also wrote, and others in the book have written, about the difficulty of disentangling Yugoslav idealism, you know, there was real and tangible support that the Yugoslav state and people offered to decolonial liberation struggles. Uh, there's an exhibition in, in Belgrade now on support to the Algerian liberation struggles. But it's hard to disentangle that from Yugoslavia's instrumentalism and its search for new markets. I frequently tell the anecdote of when Sukarno was overthrown by Suharto, one of the most bit vicious fascist regimes in the region, in the world. The Yugoslavs waited a while, but when they met with the new Indonesian leadership, their first question was, are our trade deals still okay? You know? Um, and, and so that instrumentalism is quite important. So that's the first critique, Yugocentrism. The second auto-critique has been growing in me and was reinforced by reading Piero's recent book, uh, White Enclosure. The, the, danger, the danger, I think, of taking socialist Yugoslavia as a homogeneous entity, right? A failure to reflect upon the internal divisions within Yugoslavia itself and the different meanings that non-alignment might have had for different groups across space and time. Some of that is relatively innocent, you know, there's not, there's no chapter in the book about the impact of decentralization in, in the 1974 constitution, but there's also, you know, not really a look at non-alignment as it might have been experienced by Albanians in Kosovo or in Macedonia, right? Um, and I just want to end by kind of saying that what this has made me think is that there are, you know, there are lots of questions, but I just want to throw out four of them to which I don't have answers but which I think all need more research and all need to be part of dialogues in which we don't necessarily jump to conclusions and we might legitimately agree to disagree about. And I hope they kind of help to frame the discussion. If they don't, you just ignore them. The first one, what was the relationship between the internal and external aspects of socialist Yugoslavia's role in the non-aligned movement? There's a quote from Josip Verhovets after he stopped being a uh, foreign minister, from 1983, non-alignment should be seen as a factor acting within Yugoslavia and not simply as Yugoslavia's outlook on the world. It's in this respect that non-alignment appears as one of the essential political factors of Yugoslavia's internal cohesion. Such an interesting statement because I could put three dots and say, and perhaps Yugoslavia's disintegration. I'm doing work now on the new international economic order, the impacts of the second oil crisis, and the nature of solidarity from OPEC states where they didn't support this idea of an online bank, for example, or an emergency fund. And I will put in the chat, I won't put them up here, but clearly, you know, the northern richer republics started to use Yugoslavia's involvement with the non-aligned and the global south as a racist trope to kind of think about moving from Yugoslavia. So I've got two very racist cartoons from Gallup 
in the 80s, which I will put in the chat for people to look at. Um, the second one, to what extent did a genuine commitment to decolonial solidarity and support for national liberation movements coexist with the neo-colonial oppression of Muslims, Albanians, and Roma within Yugoslavia itself? It's actually a question that Mohamed Gaddafi raises the very first time he meets Tito in uh, Lusaka in 1970. Um, maybe terms like internal colonialism, I think used by Samir Amin about South Africa, might be relevant for the Yugoslav context. Um, we do have David Hennig and Maple Raza's chapter on solidarity along the Balkan route, which is a different take on some of this. Mila Turalic discovers unused footage of Archbishop Makarios in an Orthodox church in 1961. And you've got uh, Leonora and Ivica Mladanovic, Leonora Dugonic Rodwin and Ivica Mladanovic's interviews with students from the Global South who had very different worldviews. Um, two more in the last 30 seconds. Uh, this is one I would love to do more work on. I'd love to hear people's views. Was Yugoslavia search for new markets in the Global South? itself a form of neo-colonial exploitation and extractivism, kind of replacing core periphery relations with semi-periphery periphery relations. And my good friend Stefan Guzvica, currently in Belgrade at the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory, has, has organized a series of seminars using dependency of world systems theories. And Rade Pantic spoke at that, where he was very much arguing that Yugoslavia's position in the global division of labor was a kind of neo-colonial exploitative position. I think it's complicated, I think it's conjunctural. And the final one, were transnational Islamism and transnational non-alignment competing or complementary practices of counter-hegemonic world-making? And again, I don't know. I think we need a lot more research on this. What are we actually talking about? When are we talking about? Um, so I want to conclude by saying that, for me, the decolonial lens opens up the need for research on other, also contradictory, national and transnational decolonial awakenings, forms of counter-hegemonic world-making, and their contorted, contested, and contingent, three Cs there, contorted, contested, and contingent, interrelationships. Uh, we need a global historiography. Daphne Taylor says it much better than I can. We need work to redefine the very conditions in which knowledge is produced and legitimated, situating ethical relationships as central and recognizing that what is put forward is the basis for thinking through another world. So in this sense, the stakes are high, but the room for more work and for greater dialogue is certainly real. Thank you. So what happens now? It's rather on your turn. Thank you. Uh, where are the pictures uh, Paul was going to show us? In the chat? I'm still trying to work out the technology rather. Okay, so uh, if it's my turn, thank you, Paul, for resuming uh, your own work. I'm afraid I don't have anything much uh, new or, or different to say. Uh, I will say this, that I think this book is excellent, uh, but it is a book that uh, shows uh, towards uh, many other books. It's an inclusive book uh, showing about the possibility of other books to come. And uh, you have already delineated uh, the directions, some of the directions in which your research and the research of your group may go. I appreciate your topic on the whole uh, because it is uh, critical and multifocal. And multifocal uh, approach to the non-aligned movement. 
uh, and I uh, appreciate uh, particularly your your subtitle, which is uh, nuanced uh, social, cultural, political, and economic imagine imaginaries, as uh, Sanya had uh, underscored. Right, uh, imaginaries are uh, important, and this is what we are all. Uh, Uh, working on uh, by giving this importance to uh, imaginaries you acknowledge such authors among others among many others such authors as uh, benedict anderson uh, but possibly also his brother Pe perry anderson who worked uh, competently on so many countries and uh, their social uh, political history but Benedict and Anderson, uh, not only uh, for his imagined uh, communities and uh, uh, for his work on the construction of the nation, but also uh, the Benedict Anderson uh, of the specter of uh, comparisons. Comparison is a, as an important element uh, in uh, our methodologies. And you uh, said uh, by the end of your introduction a few minutes ago that uh, it is all about knowledge, the construction of knowledge. And I agree, it is all about epistemology. So uh, Benedict Anderson's book, The Spectre of Comparisons, uh, Nationalisms, uh, Southeast Asia and the world, which means that you can uh, look at these questions from uh, whichever region in, in the world, and they will always present themselves in uh, somewhat different uh, uh, dimension or a different way. And then there is the Benedict Anderson of, on cinema, on a Thai uh, filmmaker, amazing Thai, Thai Female maker. Uh, you also acknowledge uh, authors like uh, Etienne Balibar and his book with Emmanuel uh, Wallerstein, Nation, Race, Class, where identities are fictive and constructed, right? In Benedict Anderson, they are imaginary, but uh, uh, with Balibar, they are fictive and constructed. And memories are so too not only history. Uh, and then you also acknowledge uh, uh, the Boaventura de Souza Santos uh, of uh, when he says that cultures, and I would add uh, languages too, are reciprocal, reciprocally incomplete. The reciprocal incompleteness of cultures and uh, languages and imaginaries this seems very important uh, to me. Uh, thus, uh, your uh, topic is also uh, basically epistemological, or it comes, uh, it is presented in an epistemological uh, uh, dimension, which is very important for me because uh, I'm interested in this. Now, your take on socialist Yugoslavia is that things, you tell me if, I'm, I, if, if I go wrong, but uh, I'm also guessing. Uh, but uh, what you seem to be saying is that uh, things were still moving and uh, that various outcomes could have been possible or could have been imagined, but haven't been, right? Uh, provided some conditions uh, had been granted or respected. And many of those conditions were not granted or were not respected, or we were not aware of them at that time. Uh, we all know that uh, Yugoslavia was, <laughs> unfortunately, and this is very painful also, a monumental failure. Uh, and the shame. But you and I agree, I believe, that it is necessary and possible to learn from failures. 
And then that uh, failure is, after all, not the only dimension, but there were very good initiatives, there were very good ideas, uh, very honest uh, uh, projects. Uh, and we need to be able to learn from them in order not to repeat the same mistakes, uh, which uh, poses before us the, 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 the question of, of uh, what is the aim of our research? Why do we do this? Why do we do this? And uh, what is the, uh, on the one hand, uh, um, epistemological, but on the other hand, political, political aim of uh, such re research. Uh, one thing is very important uh, uh, that you said uh, a few minutes ago about uh, uh, the difference between activism and, and uh, research and academic, uh, um, the academic dimension, uh, those uh, limits have become blurred and our generation, I'm older than you, but older uh, also in my generation, uh, you learn from activism. We have learned a lot from activism, things that we wouldn't have known otherwise, right? Uh, minorities, women, uh, and so many other things. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is absolutely important to keep on uh, those two dimensions uh, uh, intertwined or, or connected. We, we can't uh, resist, uh, we can't uh, accept now the division between these two dimensions. So uh, yes, it was a failure, but we could have learned from that failure. And uh, apparently we didn't learn much from that failure. Uh, when we have a look at the situation, in uh, Yugoslav successor countries and after our sevenfold uh, uh, partition. And uh, the non-aligned mo non movement comes into that category of features of the past from where we could learn for a shared or interconnected future internationally, internationally not only locally, but internationally. And I believe that, uh, for example, self-management uh, would be another such topic that uh, could be interesting in this way. Uh, so while you do not fix or while you do not freeze concepts and terms, and you're right not to do this, and while you allow a range of possibilities to each, you also give the liberty to your authors, the authors in your book, uh, to develop different visions and uh, interpretations. And it's a collective book in the best sense, uh, after which we can only raise questions. Where do we go further uh, with this uh, research? What is important here for me is uh, the notion of uh, useless history. Useless history, quote unquote, that you don't, you don't use that term, never mind. But uh, I have adopted that term from the Zagreb uh, writer and friend Slobodan Schneider. Uh, I feel uh, this term, although you don't use it, is critically present in your thinking as it is in mine, whole historic periods, lives and decades of common life and cohabitation are being erased by a stroke or have been erased by a stroke. Right? And one morning you wake up and, and you don't have any connection uh, to your recent past or to the past of your uh, family and uh, you are not allowed to use the name of your uh, uh, country unless you use the word former, right? And so on. Uh, so uh, these uh, erasures must be studied. Uh, these erasures in 
uh, the if we study uh, Yugoslavia, these erasures, uh, erasures concerning Yugoslavia, but if we study the non-aligned movement and then we needn't stick to Yugoslavia, uh, we shall come across so many other uh, erasures. The best book to read about this I, I have uh, read uh, uh, lately is by Jie Hyun Lim, Global Easts a wonderful book about uh, uh, these things. There are gaps of 40 years in the case of uh, uh, Yugoslavia and post-Yugoslav countries, or of 80 years uh, in the case of uh, the um, Soviet Union and, and post-Soviet countries. With cultivated blindness with, uh, uh, and with willed ignorance. So you have been interested Inter interested in this useless history, which is not so useless, a useless or superfluous history of the non-aligned movement to rehabilitating the concept uh, and uh, the segment of past history for a possible but not obligatory uh, future usage, not as a nostalgic and fruitless return to the past. The question then becomes, what can we learn from NAM, from the non-aligned movement uh, in the perspective of socialist Yugoslavia? And how does it fit with the failures of Yugoslavia? This is the, the, <laughs> this is the main uh, question and the most difficult one, because it uh, requires a historic uh, research in all directions and all uh, dimensions. Uh, besides this way of putting uh, your topic, I also find irresistible uh, your personal role in it, Paul, uh, in this other's history, other people's history. Uh, I compare uh, my situation and yours. I was born in non-alignment, but you were not. So how does someone else's karma stick to you? How does someone else's karma stick to one? And I have seen it in other examples uh, occasionally. Karma can stick uh, where it doesn't belong. <laughs> uh, and how does uh, Nam stick to a person who was not born in, in, in the non-aligned movement? This is a question of the preconditions and the ways of knowledge preconditions, what, what are the conditions, uh, previous conditions of our knowledge? What is the, the, the obliterated, erased uh, knowledge that we lack in order to, to follow the line? Because we are presented with, a, with interruptions, with consecutive interruptions all the time, whereas there is a uh, continuity also. Everything that is disconnected is also connected in some other way, right? This is what I say, this, uh, I will open uh, a parenthesis. Uh, uh, when I say that uh, uh, women uh, uh, connect uh, uh, men's, uh, the, the interruption in men's uh, 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 lineage, right? <laughs> this is why they're all, uh, in the lineage has to be uh, forgotten or erased. This is why they don't transmit the name, etc. This is why patriarchy and so on. This is another question. Uh, but here again, as in our case, we have interruptions that are connected uh, in a different way. And I also find, I must say, the identitarian uh, attitude off. This is my people, this is my identity, and the victimhood competition from the point of view of one's own nationality, I, I find it uh, limited and uh, deplorable uh, in most cases, and also of uh, uh, bad taste. And now, this is something you surely don't do, of course, uh, you are a counterexample, and, and your book is a counterexample. Uh, 
you have always been able to identify with others at the difference with, for example, uh, <laughs> Miriana Kasapovich, whom we read uh, recently, <laughs> that paper that we read. Uh, uh, and uh, she, she is uh, sort of uh, usurping uh, the post-colonial uh, vocabulary. She's also usurping and, and, and misusing uh, Dubravka Ugresic, her name, just a few days after Dubravka uh, died. Okay, I close this uh, parenthesis, which is of no importance. Uh, now, I think that this uh, uh, um, aspect of de-identifying is the only approach possible. It is sobering and uh, confirmed also in Jie Hyun's uh, mentioned book, uh, Global East, uh, which works on the solidarity of some collective memories and the lack of solidarity in other collective memories. Both exist and both need to be researched on. Uh, history, memory and trauma are also constructed. It is not only that uh, uh, um, nations are constructed and so on. Uh, now the, the unspoken, unnamed uh, recipe, in my view, would be don't identify with your own. Uh, with your own group, rather de-identify with where you come from. I take you as an example, Paul. Uh, that is the only way in history, which doesn't mean at all, and I do not mean at all, not recognizing the, the sufferings of one's own group and not uh, uh, claiming uh, uh, justice for one's own group too. But as uh, the writer, philosopher Radomir Konstantinovich had shown, victims uh, can, though they needn't, become perpetrators. Uh, take, uh, take Israel, take the country of Israel and many others. So uh, be ready to always defend the others. And that way you will also be able to defend yourself and yours. This is a lesson hard to learn. Uh, we saw it in the Yugoslav war and now in the Ukrainian war too. Inclusiveness is the first to disappear uh, when there is trouble. Uh, for example, in India, when they have riots in, in, in uh, ethnic riots or religious riots, uh, <clears throat> you have women uh, working across the groups, right? Uh, but when it becomes really tough, uh, they go and join uh, their men in throwing stones to the other group. And then when it is a little bit more relaxed, re, re, relaxed, they go and cooperate with women from the other group in order to connect. Uh, and by the way, they are the only ones who do this, to reconnect uh, the, the, uh, the opposed uh, uh, groups. Of course, not only Yugoslavia, but also the non-aligned movement was full of contradictions and some very ugly ones we can all agree on them. And we also, I think, uh, all agree on which, one, which ones they are. <clears throat> but uh, human institutions or enterprises on the whole are full of contradictions. So uh, Yugoslavia and NAM are not an exception here. Uh, this is why failed and erased histories are crucial and must be studied. This is what you do in your book. 
And uh, when studying such contradictions, I believe it is important to evade, uh, uh, avoid the binary, the binary in which contradictions uh, tend to thrive and uh, lead to a dead end and to repetition, right? Uh, this is the worst. There are always uh, more than two elements in uh, or attitudes uh, in a conflict, but uh, we don't, we may not want to see them. So um, contradictions can also be eye-opening and show a pl plurality of options. This is why they are important. Otherwise you wouldn't see, see anything if you were not uh, uh, pulled by, by, by those uh, uh, contradictions. And uh, the suffering of one's own group also can uh, be an eye opener, but it can also be an eye uh, closer. Right? So uh, we have to be uh, careful about identifications. And uh, we must bear in mind that it is easier to be critical and intelligent post festum. And this is what we are doing uh, in studying uh, <laughs> non-alignment now. Um, but it is important that this be done. Uh, clinging to identities post festum, however, is disastrous and it often leads to a fixed and rigid configuration that doesn't allow uh, political imagination and the change in knowledge building and, and uh, transmission. Uh, your book is the opposite of all of that. Most of your authors and yourself have underscored the contradictions of the construction of both NAM and uh, uh, Yugoslavia and their limits, although limits are extendable. Of course, you have not studied everything. Of course, uh, this is not uh, finished uh, research. Of course, there are 10 books coming behind. I hope you are busy on those next 10 or 15 books. In seeing uh, the non-aligned movement as a possible alternative globalization avant la lettre in, in your uh, introduction, you open the question of erased history or of active forgetting, as you say, inflicted uh, or inflicted programmed forgetting. Of course, today we tend to express it all in today's political language. And this is also difficult because we have, uh, we use translation, a, a time translation uh, that we have no codes for. We invent the translation at the same time. Uh, the language we use is often that of post-colonialism, of decoloniality. Your own uh, vocabulary varies a little uh, on this, uh, or even sometimes uh, subaltern studies. Uh, we must, I think, uh, get beyond adopting uh, ready-made conceptualizations, and we all know it, right? But uh, these uh, other uh, uh, conceptualizations are, I eye-openers themselves. Rather, I hate to do this. It, um, I, I want to make sure, that, yeah, that we have time for- I pass my time. In any uh, case, yeah. I can stop here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and sorry if I was too long. I didn't actually no. have a look at my no. watch. Well, I think uh, Rada and Paul covered everything there is to say about the book, the non-alignment and um, contemporary politics of solidarity, I guess. There's not much uh, I could add to that. Um, maybe maybe I wanna add something to both of the questions or the issues that you both rather raised. And so one of the questions is of course, this issue that Paul, you raise about the sort of misaligned Yugoslav policies in the non-alignment between its 
the goals of self-determination that it pursued in the international arena and the lack of that principle within Yugoslavia. But I don't think that was only a Yugoslav issue, in part because all members of the non-aligned movement came from similar dynamics, West Papua in the case of Indonesia, Western Sahara in the case of Morocco. And so I think what these self-determination movements within the non-aligned movements, the kind of questions they raise that relates to the theoretical underpinnings of your book is about the differences between and the tensions between post-colonial self-determination and decoloniality, whereby uh, decoloniality considers post-colonial nation states simply as a continuation of colonial relations of power and modernity. And so in that sense, I don't think necessarily that Yugoslavia was an exception, although considering that most of us here are Yugoslavs, we probably think we we're, we tend to think that that was more the case in Yugoslavia than in other places. Um, but my my concern with the non-aligned movement, I mean, obviously the book is all encompassing and covers so many uh, diverse areas of the non-aligned movement. I'm more interested in fundamentally what the non-aligned movement did for the Yugoslav party apparatchiks, because after all, they were the ones that were driving the project. And in driving the project, I think one thing that rarely comes up is how in trying to negotiate through the non-aligned movement, through seeking leadership in the non-aligned movement, a new economic order between the North and South, Yugoslavia reached a deal with the West that created or gave it power rather to um, become a member of the IMF to access World Bank loans and to associate with the European trading bloc by 1965. And what this me meant was that Yugoslavia was in a far better economic position by taking those World Bank loans to create development projects in the global South that it was supposedly in solidarity with. And so the question that you raise about uh, what these development projects did, I think it's a very important question because it kind of illustrates um, or recenters rather the center periphery relations as opposed to opening it up to some sort of an alternative from the Cold War binary East West. So I think to me, those are very interesting uh, histories. And speaking of erased histories, is that Part of the Yugoslav participation in the non-aligned movement and part of the deal with the West to uh, receive funding from the World Bank was also to maintain a strong military to uh, prevent uh, possible Soviet attacks on NATO's southern fleets. And so Yugoslavia was already sort of... Um, militarily and economically aligning with the West and becoming uh, becoming this uh, um, in-betweener between the colonizers and the post-colonial um, political and economic realities of the world. Um, and so I'm not, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm not sure what I can say other than that, but I think Another way, perhaps, because Rada mentioned how Yugoslavia was a monumental failure, which I believe it was, but I think another way to perhaps think about that failure is to think of it as what Jack Halberstam calls a queer failure, to kind of pursue the difficult questions of complicity um, and to kind of find more counterintuitive forms of solidarity and resistance that hide in the archives of the non-aligned movement, and also the kind of connections that the non-aligned movement made possible, even though they were not necessarily part of the official conferences. And for me, this was very important for my own research, because when I look at Izet Begovic's associations and connections with pan-Islamist in the Arab world, you can see that a lot of those connections were made possible by the fact that Yugoslav 
um, students and intellectuals were able to travel throughout the Arab world, but also students and intellectuals from the Arab world made rounds in Yugoslav universities. And in the process, a lot of literature was um, uh, uh, spread around, a lot of connections were made, and sort of new uh, political ideas of what it means to decolonize, what it means to seek liberation, what it means to seek equality, justice, um, uh, became possible as an unintentional consequence or as a counterintuitive consequence of the more formal non-aligned um, politics. And for me, those are very interesting projects to pursue because, I mean, in the end, they're also failed projects in as much as we live in a capitalist colonial hell. None of these seem to have obviously worked. Um, but yeah, I think dwelling in the in the in the uh, um, peripheries of the non-aligned archives may be generative of thinking how those connections were made possible and also what it meant to travel. Uh, because I mean, we take for granted now that some student from Yugoslavia could simply go to Sudan and a student from Sudan could go to Yugoslavia. And today that journey can only be made through very precarious um, if at all possible, by the European Union border regime, deathly border regime, I would say. And so those are, I think, very interesting questions to raise and to also remember about what the post-Cold War Europeanization of post-Yugoslav spaces has meant in real terms of mobility. And as you say, I mean, one of the chapters that... Um, David Henning and Maple Reza do um, um, address some of those issues. So I, I really have nothing else to add other than um, to maybe dwell further into those contradictions, but also to ask what self-determination as a concept meant within and outside the non-aligned um, movement, um, perhaps as an historical, but also as a political, um, question. So I'll stop there. Um, hopefully we can have more discussions around the questions that... Thank you. Well, Thank you, Pira, very much. Thank you, uh, Paul and Rada. Most grateful for what uh, you said. It's complementary. It's very different from different perspectives and uh, uh, beautifully put together. Uh, and uh, th this is... Uh, uh, something that uh, makes me think of uh, what is next, how to, uh, like, I know uh, just a few days ago, I, I spoke with a, with a colleague from international relations and he said, oh, querying international relations, it's so strong, it's very important. And uh, uh, this, and, and then we spoke about uh, his father building uh, in Ethiopia, uh, bridges, etc. So uh, it's uh, mm, uh, to to overcome what we are now having through that uh, painful and vulnerable uh, migration studies uh, that we need to process uh, all the, the hostilities, all the whiteness. Piro refers to to your book. All that is uh, induced uh, through. Uh, hatefulness through that uh, uh, populist uh, imaginaries again imaginaries uh, it's uh, it's essential uh, what you were saying and it's essential to queer it yes uh, and to move forward uh, with the, uh, again uh, discussing it uh, for, for the next round uh, for the new perspective of uh, Again, in Halberstam's terms, uh, uh, what, what is uh, what is next? Uh, I'm opening the floor for the questions, and uh, I'm certain that there will be some some uh, remarks, not only questions. Uh, I recognize also some of uh, uh, um, persons that contributed to the book. Uh, so please. 
in the meantime, maybe uh, Piero has a question for Rada, Rada has a question for Paul, Paul has a question for Piero. Uh, it's a nicely put mechanism and I'm certain that uh, the discussion uh, can uh, uh, continue uh, not only through, uh, through very precise elements uh, that you uh, discussed upon. Uh, maybe I would like to say something uh, to break the ice of the discussion uh, after hearing uh, Piro uh, and all the new inputs he put into uh, this whole uh, material. Uh, I must say that I don't uh, believe uh, at all in any uh, general uh, deal between Yugoslavia and the West. Uh, I don't believe in anything like that. Uh, uh, there were compromises. There were compromises, IMF, banks, this and that. Uh, Yugoslavia was a very unstable uh, country in a way, and it took when it could from the East, from the Soviet Union, and then when it could from the West, uh, it also ended up, uh, as you know, our uh, war, our civil war of the 90s. This is also one of the forbidden things. You don't call it a civil war, right? Uh, what we had in the 90s. Uh, we ended up with uh, Serbia having so much uh, 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 Soviet armament, right? Don't forget that. Uh, but uh, I am sure uh, that uh, there were, uh, um, what do you call it? You, you use the word, Piro, unintentional consequences. Unintentional consequences of a politics which was not thoroughly thought through and uh, which was, uh, we say in French, bricolage. I don't know what you, how you call it in English. Uh, bricolage is when you uh, try to fix things uh, not permanently, uh, but uh, then uh, you fix it from one end and it uh, goes wrong from the other end. The whole politics was like that. It was not uh, uh, the, the theory was not enough to uh, feed back the practice with any uh, reasonable solutions, right? So uh, they did what they could uh, to survive. And this was unintentional, as you said, you said unintentional consequence. I will adopt that uh, expression uh, now. This is one thing I, I, I don't agree with you, Piro. And the other things, well, we can, uh, the other things could be discussed. But uh, I'm sure there were uh, compromises here and there, and, and very often, too often, they are, were not uh, uh, part of a general project. There was no general uh, project of Yugoslavia uh, having been bought by the West. I don't believe that at all. Thank you, Urada. This is great because you did uh, break the ice. Uh, Jure, uh, Ramsha, please, uh, uh, you have a question and maybe we can collect a few comments or questions and then respond. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, actually I have a comment um, and I would like to support Rada's argument uh, um, uh, because, well, I mean, I'm the first who like to show ambiguities and uh, hypocrisies and so on in the, in the uh, arguments of the Yugoslav economists and politicians. And I'm, I'm doing this in, in the last word of my chapter when I'm speaking a bit cynically about uh, uh, the last uh, Yugoslav foreign minister launcher. But still, I mean, uh, the story is not, it, it's more complicated as Piro said. I mean, it's, it's, there are not two camps and uh, like um, 
this narrative that Yugoslavia kind of uh, solves itself to, to the Western or the, the, the um, Northwestern elites uh, is, is, is wrong, I think, because they, they believed up to the very end about the, the progressive forces inside of the Western institution, inside of the World Bank, for which Paul said in one of our uh, last exchanges that it was not so bad, I think, Paul. <laughs> and so uh, at, at that period, uh, and, and with, with some of, because all, uh, the World Bank, of course, is again, not a homogeneous body. So inside of the UN, different uh, agencies, institutions, you had different voices, and uh, that was the policy of Yugoslavia, I think, to collaborate with these forces, which we which were not equal to the to the main elites in Washington, London, uh, Paris, um, Bonn, and so on. So uh, um, this, I think, is is uh, one important issue. Uh, Generally about the book, I think it's 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 very important that we are um, talking to each other, uh, people from different fields of uh, academia, because I I have a feeling that we are uh, reproducing the division which was uh, which has existed um, uh, during the NAM itself, or Yugoslav experts, or art historians were talking with the artists, uh, the um, and, and so on, like the, the, the experts for uh, fishing management were only dealing with the fishing <laughs> issues from the global south and so on and so on. So here in, in this, uh, this beautiful volume, uh, Paul managed to gather all of us uh, um, to speak with um, one another. Um, historians stand in the, the last presentation I, I, I listened to, uh, show this like we historians tend to speak from more realist uh, perspective of, uh, of international relations and it is important for us uh, you know to to see other uh, to see this uh, imaginary uh, part which we already heard is uh, very much uh, important okay thanks Thank you very much, Jure. Uh, I presume uh, Peter is ready to respond or not willing to respond or- we No, no, I'll, I'll, I mean, I'll respond because I do find this kind of, it's amazing how we always say that, you know, this is not about nostalgia and it's not about Yugo nostalgia, but Yugo nostalgia seems to be a creature that keeps bringing its head up, especially when people from the South of Yugoslavia speak about their experiences. And I think that's something to be said about that, especially. But uh, let me mention some facts here just to clear the air. Yugoslavia did become a member of the IMF. Yugoslavia did receive loans from the IMF. Yugoslavia did use those loans to create development projects in all of the non-aligned countries, including Libya, Syria, um, uh, Iraq, uh, and Indonesia. Yugoslav non-aligned projects benefited from the IMF loans. They benefited from the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which they entered in 1965. So in other words, Yugoslavia gained capital by playing this position, not of equals in Washington and London, as um, I forget the name, Jure just mentioned, but rather as a subsidiary of those interests for the non-aligned uh, countries. And it did this not because it was pursuing some uh, designed theory, but because it had to survive in the context of the Sino-Soviet split and the fact that it faced continuous threats from both sides of the camp, so to speak. But sorry, Peter, so this was in, not the case. Well, let me finish because yeah. I heard you, now you're gonna hear me. I know how, uh, uh, impatient we can get, like I said, when, you know, people from the South speak. But so this is, these are the experiences, obviously, that don't make it into the book. And they don't make it into the book because the book doesn't necessarily deal with what the non-alignment may have been for people in uh, Lib uh, Lebanon, for people in Syria, for people 
in Iraq, right? This is a very Eurocentric experience. And so when you say that Yugoslav authorities working in Washington or London with the IMF and the World Bank were not on equal footing, well, of course, they weren't on equal footing. But from the perspective of the global south, they were nonetheless reproducing those same dynamics of power. And these same dynamics of power, as it happens, are reproduced within Yugoslavia. Because what starts to happen when Yugoslavia takes loans from the IMF, as we very well know, is the financialization of the Yugoslav system within Yugoslavia. And the inequalities that existed within Yugoslavia skyrocketed, in part because Yugoslavia started to develop its own neoliberal policies by the late 70s. And so these aren't issues that are disconnected or confusing or, oh, poor Yugoslavia found itself in an unsuitable position and it had to play. Yugoslavia knew very well what it was doing. And so in as much as it had to sustain its sovereignty and benefit from its geopolitical position and its position in the non-aligned movement, it did so maximally, right? And so there was no uh, imaginary here of socialist solidarity. For the Yugoslav communist apparatchik, the non-aligned movement meant uh, ex uh, receiving the much needed hard currency and oil as the Adria oil project ended up becoming in the absence of foreign trade uh, disbalances. So that as far as the economic aspect of Yugoslavia is concerned. But since I'm on this issue, I also want to raise this question of how we think of Yugoslavia, right? Because uh, to me, it sounds like we narrate theoretically an understanding that being nostalgic about Yugoslavia is bad. We always say that. That's become like a preface in American liberal universities where you say being racist is bad, right? But then we go on to become to be just as racist. And similarly, when you have conversations with Yugoslavs about Yugoslavia, they're like, oh yeah, uh, nostalgia is reactionary, it's horrible. But then they turn around and they say something which is nothing but, you know, Yugoslav tears over the Yugoslav projects. And as an Albanian, I have no such tears because Albanians not only received the bottom of the barrel of the Yugoslav project, but they actually weren't even invited as interpreters and translators or singers of the Quran as Muslims from Bosnia were for the uh, non-aligned dignitaries. And so these are obviously things that are missing in the book that I didn't wanna bring up, but that I am made to bring up obviously, because clearly there's nobody there from Albania, from Macedonia, right, or somebody from a Roma perspective that may talk about the non-aligned movement. What we hear is the typical Zagreb, Ljubljana, Belgrade discourse that seeks to somehow redeem the socialist project by saying that anytime Yugoslavia did something wrong, it did so because his hand was twisted or because it found itself in a particular predicament. That is willful ignorance, and that kind of ignorance in the highly esteemed cadre of the Yugoslav Communist Party just didn't exist they were counting their chickens. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Piero. This is what I said. I said, we need to continue. There is another book that should be done, uh, maybe more South, but I'm certain uh, that Radha also with, uh, with colleagues from India, uh, we can have also that uh, Global South perspective. Uh, and it can be extremely useful. I hear Boris, Boris Budin and then Dubravka and then again Jure. I'm certain that there is a lot to respond, but let's let's hear uh, new uh, new perspectives and maybe new comments. Boris. Yes, uh, thank you. Greetings from uh, Vienna. I have a very clear uh, question about the epistemological uh, status of this knowledge, you know, of, of, the, of the book. Uh, because it seems to me, you know, Rada mentioned the, 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 the notion of useless knowledge, and I'm afraid that it might become a useless, useless knowledge, uh, having in mind that the process of uh, collapse of Yugoslavia actually takes place as a form of realignment of the, of the pieces of Yugoslavia. As you know, 
this is the realignment in terms of uh, take take the case of Croatia uh, re-identification with its Western European identity coming back from the Balkans uh, back home as it was as it was said. Uh, this is uh, one thing and another thing is that within what is today called, uh, uh, Euro-Atlantic integration, in which we don't know, is it now Europe or the West, but definitely a new normative identity block of which uh, 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 significant parts of former Yugoslavia uh, have become uh, parts, that this uh, uh, within this uh, <laughs> normative identity block, there is no interest and need whatsoever for this legacy of non-alignment of former Yugoslavia, take for instance the, the, the official memory culture of the European Union, which not only you know will never find interest for for so such knowledge, but uh, has no interest for the whole you know emancipatory struggle against fascism, uh, 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 NOB, etc. Et so this knowledge. Uh, within the, the the new process of realignment is necessarily um, uh, necessarily disappears. So, uh, my question would be: Do we have? Are, are we dealing about some construction which I was writing about very critical about Yugo uh, 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 Yugoslav studies? You know, as as a local branch of area studies ideological Western concept of production of, of, of areas, and uh, whether we are here actually at mercy of the Western foundation to find some interest in, in this knowledge, and if not, you know, then there won't be this knowledge. So rather just to, you know, the uh, if, if you, you said, well, it was a colossal failure of former Yugoslavia, uh, one should uh, learn from it, not to repeat it. Well, there is no subject to repeat it. So uh, there is nobody to learn from it. My question again is, what is the epistemological status of this knowledge? Which use of this knowledge is? And whether it, there is any chance to save this legacy in the future? Thank you. Rada, uh, you will respond straight away, or maybe Paul and Piro also have something to add to other this. Other people before. Yeah, okay. yeah I, I think we should maybe wrap up. Good. Each person. Good, thank you. Dubravka, please. So, uh, thanks so much for organizing this. Uh, I'm architect in the room, so uh, we as an architect uh, have um, um, there is something uh, which is liberating a bit, be about being epistemically and methodologically promiscuous uh, because uh, the object of study kind of asks you to, uh, to, to figure out how you're going to interrogate. And it's also incredible. I have been really enjoying I just recently finished reading your book, Piro, and I have been really enjoying it. And it uh, helps. So, so um, there is some, so I wrote this chapter, which is looking into the work of Yugoslav construction, like kind of through Energo Project, which was this bell company from Belgrade, because I was actually really interested in the ways in which, how come the first, first it was how I never heard about any of these projects um, when I was studying architecture. So in a way in Belgrade, so in a way that how this kind of, how this was separated as something that is not to be kind of discussed. It was, and then I was also, also I'm born in 1980. So I, and I'm Yugoslav from kind of in which in family tree brings south and north of kind of very kind of both south and north in, and I'm from Niche, which is already some kind of, North South dynamic in relation to Belgrade, where I was studying. So, so I was also really interested in. Well, uh, uh, I was also really interested in the how come the the long the longer exposure to this 
kind of true non-alignment non actually did not in increase anti-racism, but actually increased races, race racism. And that was something that I kind of started to really notice in relation to when I start, started to kind of look, da, da, dig into this kind of work of Energo Project. Uh, and, that there is, and that kind of a close look into the projects, which all, always I kind of one of the limits that I knew is that I actually was interested in looking from the what these projects did for the kind of articulation of cor 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 kind of corporative tendency cor 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 corporation tendencies and also some kind of a relation to professionalization from the position of Yugoslavia. I knew that there is a limit. I can't discuss these projects in relation to what they were doing there. Uh, if because of, because of many kind of history, but also because there is no there was no also this other part of understanding how the project got there. So there, I kind of consciously did this with these limits, with this limit. And of course, this kind of opens up a can of problems or not. But just to kind of, but something that I started to understand is that for engineers and economists and architects, but especially in kind of relation to architects and engineers, working on the projects abroad was exposure not just to non-aligned countries, but it was also exposure to the various international engineering and professionalized elites. And how with time, uh, I kind of tried to discuss this in, a, in this chapter, but I think there is a little bit of kind of expanded version of this chapter uh, and in kind of that's kind of conclusion of PhD. I realized that there is a Western or whiteness consciousness that takes over because the because the architects really wanted the bourgeois designation of being an architect, which they felt also if, if without, even though there is was the kind of a red bourgeoisie and hierarchization of a society within Yugoslavia re-emerging, they still kind of felt that so the social social self-management is robbing them off of this being a proper proper uh, kind of architect, which meaning being this kind of a bourgeois in Sylvia Winter's word, overrepresented uh, kind of Leonardo's man, white. And that that in a way started to increase and become fortified in this exchange. And with that, all the kind of capitalist tendency, all the corporate tendencies that existed with this company. And then in a way, the way that this was rejected from the knowledge. So for example, architecture faculty in Belgrade never ever established a courses that would deal with design and climates that are different than the climates of Yugoslavia. Precisely because this was relegated as a less in less valuable knowledge, shows showed for me that that in a way, while there there was certain solidarity that I don't think that we need to completely question, there was this kind of uh, uh, epistemic uh, ep kind of capture that never was fundamentally challenged and with time was taking over because precisely working in this kind of international context and because of the fall of no, international, new, new international economic order and everything, because the whole restructuring of the world never managed to happen. On the economic level, they never also managed to happen. And for me, this was something that was really important to try to think with. And I think that if we are also doing all this work because we are interested in how to intervene into now, uh, at least this is where, where I am. For me, this is yet another kind of push to understand that what does it actually mean to think about space without kind of falling constantly into this abyss of thinking through disciplinary formation, which is so tied to, to uh, one, one specific uh, subjectivity. Which in a way is that, and that, that's also the context in which Yugoslavia with, with all its problems was not, had a bit of an ambivalent relation of what kind of a subjectivity it wants to produce. Uh, okay, so now we are having more, 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 more 
discussion. Uh, Jure, I would just like to ask you, are you going to respond to Piro or we are going to uh, privilege the situation where we are going to hear new people jumping in like Chiara uh, and uh, I don't yes, know. Yes, um, I have a very short response to Piro and that's why I, I tried to interrupt it. You're very impolitely, sorry for that. So uh, I want just to say that, uh, you know, the, the policy of using money from World Bank and other institutions, this was part of the NIAO. So part, oh, again, sorry. Um, Uh, Yura disappeared, is it? Yeah. Chiara, please go on. Uh, yeah, maybe I'm coming back to what uh, Boris was mentioning about this return to the West. I'm, at the moment, I'm in Ljubljana doing some research on, on Vida Tomšić, and I was talking to somebody who collaborated with her um, in the 80s, uh, in the mid 80s, and she was mentioning how she had a team of uh, people working with her uh, about all these non-aligned issues and cooperation and okay there was this instrumental interest obviously about trade but there was also this uh, this strong interest in women in development right and so in, in my chapter I'm talking about this gender imaginaries of, of citizenship and utopia and how this modernization imaginary is connected also to gender rights and, and women's emancipation and so I think that is an element that hasn't been really explored in 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 the research and um and somehow i was lucky enough to get an erc grant that i'm gonna bring at the university of venice uh, so um this is life-changing for me because i've been trying to get out of ireland for quite a while and i'm really excited to be able to <laughs> uh take take this project um back to the region so to say you're close to the region and i think uh, and one of the idea is to go beyond this eugocentric um, approach and framework and to include other countries. So the countries that are included are India, Egypt, Tunisia, and, and Cuba. And so to look at, you know, how, how these women were, were communicating with each other, what kind of uh, lobbying they were doing in uh, UN settings. Uh, they were more, like the, the biographies we found, we singled out is they were, these women were very active on Planned Parenthood before the feminist second wave. So what did that mean? How did they contest this Western population politics? So there might be there some kind of radical aspect, although it is state sponsored, definitely. And it, there are ambivalences uh, about this whole top down organizing. So that's all to be seen. But that's just I just wanted to introduce the gender dimension. Thank you. Thank you, Chiara, and congratulations for the uh, ERC. And then uh, you will be close. So uh, we will continue. Huh? working on these topics. And I'm certain that Radha will also be delighted uh, bringing in all these Global South feminists that uh, uh, are able to dig on, on uh, our uh, histories. I don't know who is behind the iPhone because I don't have a name, but please iPhone, you, you, you can have a word. Hi, uh, Daniela Mistorovic. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> Daniela. <laughs> I've been spying on you. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, Daniela, go ahead. Hey, I just uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you. Uh, it's nice to see uh, Chiara, Boris, uh, Piero, everyone. Um, so I just have my two cents on uh, this debate. I'm glad it's developing. I'm glad it's finally happening. Um, so um, as much as, uh, again, the criticism of being you go nostalgic, I don't know. We'll see about that. Uh, but, but I definitely think we need to position ourselves in these debates. Uh, there is, of course, a lot to learn from the specter of socialist Yugoslavia. Um, but what needs to be th th this, this whole trend or uh, decolonial theory, I've been very much uh, involved with it um, in the past couple of years. Um, and what I find interesting about Yugoslav socialism is that although these struggles uh, are not always uh, um, you know, in being anti-colonial, so, so socialism, Yugoslav socialism is not always uh, uh, necessarily decolonial. And I think it's important to position oneself, uh, oneself here. Um, and my take on, <clears throat> especially after 
uh, again, p being positioned in the context of uh, of the Bosnian Herzegovinian left, uh, organizing the feminist festival Blasphem, and interacting with uh, scholars from Pristina more recently, and Roma scholar. Uh, uh, it's only Elena Savic so far, um, but um, I I've come to uh, certain kinds of understanding, and of course, reading Piro's uh, White Encounters, um, that Yugoslav, uh, 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 you know. As, as much uh, as Yugoslav revolution and socialist modernity were at heart anti-colonial, uh, I disagree that Yugoslavia really was an empire despite the uneven development of its republics. And I think coming from Bosnia and Herzegovina gives me some legitimacy in claiming that. So I've been trying to really unpack what's anti-colonial, what's decolonial, what's the work of decolonization. And if, if we try to map um, decolonial theory and practice today, we would look into the works of scholars such as Savage, such as Rajepi, such as people working on NAM historians mostly. Um, but also in Bosnia and Herzegovina, the role of the international community and everything would happen here. And perhaps the right question in discussing what does it mean to decolonize, and here I take from Tak and Yang that decoloniality, decolonization is not a metaphor, and it shouldn't be understood as a metaphor, uh, is first to ask, well, how are we colonized? And who is colonizing us right now? And where are these, uh, um, you know, uh, grievances, so to speak? So, uh, for instance, for Piero, my, my uh, issue is that, especially coming from uh, the Bosnian Herzegovina left uh, wholeheartedly, uh, especially after the 2014 2015 movements. Uh, there is, of course, you, you, you've done historical research on Alija Zbegovic and, and, uh, and uh, uh, Melika Bosnavi, and I've read that. Uh, but however, I'd be a little worried uh, about raising Alija Zbegovic to a decolonial figure, especially the context of the SDA now falling in Bakiri Zbegovic and uh, <clears throat> everything that's happening in Bosnia. Herzegovina, uh, Bosnia Herzegovina, uh, especially, I mean, I've discussed it, of course, in Bosnia, everything is divided. We always talk in Serbs, Croats, Bosniaks, who is who. Um, and really the, the protests of 2015 taught us to say nothing will be named after you. And this also refers to the Zbigovic family, uh, which has been, uh, you know, I mean, we cannot compare Zbigovic to Dodik or Chovic, or I don't want to go into that. But there is potential danger. Of course, we can tie to a certain period, the pan-Islamic uh, 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 movement of the 70s and the 80s. And uh, Bugarel writes about it uh, in his book, Islam and Nationhood in um, uh, Surviving Empires. But I'm really just a little worried uh, about Izid Begovic, like especially when it translates to the now, here and now. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's because uh, it just resonates differently once you're in Bosnia. And I could go on and on and I'll talk about who colonized and how Bosnia has been colonized by the international community and the Comprador ethno-national Salis, but I don't want to go into that. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's important to map what these decolonial uh, endeavors will be and how especially people from the South Kosovo, Kosovars and Roma have been completely occluded. Uh, and I would also add to that Bosnians and Herzegovinians occluded from the Zagreb Belgrade dialogue. And this is a uh, food for thought uh, for later. But yeah, this is just my two cents. Uh, thank you very much. It's nice to see you all. Thank you, Daniela. Uh, George Loftus, please. Hello. Uh, the, so many of you don't know me, but I am a, a PhD student at uh, FU Berlin. And I'm writing on the interaction of non-alignment and Islam in Bosnia as governor in Yugoslavia. So Paul's last question there, I'm glad he asked because it's at the center of my PhD thesis, uh, whether transnational Islamism uh, and transnational non-alignment are complementary or competing. And um, whilst I don't have an answer for this yet, I hope to in a few years, uh, my thing is more that that question and Piro's uh, response and then everything that's been said, I think something I would like to say about non-alignment is perhaps we need to rethink our periodization. And um, there's this sort of sense that 1961 is the beginning of a, a whole, it's like a tabula rasa moment in the international community from the perspective of Yugoslavia. And it seems to me that what Piro said especially got me thinking that maybe this wet the, the the break with Stalin and then the Western turn of Yugoslavia, which we often 
policy is maybe stopping in 1961 perhaps necessarily preceded the potential that non-alignment had in those early years that the was the western turn was necessary for the global turn to then happen and i guess also the question islam for me and what peter said about mobilities is that if we think about non-alignment from the perspective of certain sections of the bosnian muslim religious elite who are my uh, figures of study, um, there's certain sections who were already experiencing a high mobility in the 1920s and the 1930s um, between Egypt and uh, particularly the, the sort of the, the, the Middle East, but then wider mobilities were also happening and were also opening up. And it's often said that the non-alignment enabled in a kind of instrumental sense by the Yugoslav state, the movement of Muslims and Muslim clerics and, and sort of diplomats and things like that. But it seems to me that there's a longer history of mobilities here, which the non-alignment then kind of entered into and shifted and changed and, and modified and um, was, I think, important, including ideologically. Um, but I think there's much more we need to, when talking about non-alignment and these kinds of open questions, move beyond maybe this kind of strict periodization of 61 to, to 92. and think maybe about how it fits into local and global kind of pre-existing networks and ideas. Thank you, George. I, I see your uh, thesis is advancing. If you are on that line, then it's uh, on good, good route. <laughs> uh, no, I'm joking. Uh, here we, we, uh, we, we hear uh, that there is much room to discuss and to move forward, really taking into account all that have been said. Uh, Rada, Paul, uh, now I see Artan Mustafa, some figures related to social insurance during Islamic socialism in Kosovo. Okay, thank you, Artan. Uh, anyone wants to react to what we've heard? Piro, go ahead. Thank you. So, um, well, first I'll say something that uh, George mentioned and also Boris Budin mentioned. And I think there's been an ongoing effort to unsettle the spatial and temporal categories around which we think of um, Yugoslavia, but the Balkans more broadly. And so they don't, I think that we don't necessarily follow those. I mean, at least personally, I don't, because for instance, for most Pomaks in uh, Bulgaria or for most Albanians in Macedonia, they will give you the kind of temporality that, it, that goes like this. The first Serb, the second Serb, the third Serb, Yugoslavia being the third Serb. In their imaginaries, the temporalities around which they organize their time and space was not around the political and ideological uh, questions. And so for me personally, attending and being more in tune with those kind of temporalities, it's important because they tell us about the experiences of the undercommons in these larger uh, ideological and political projects around which area studies has sought to place Yugoslavia in particular in a certain category as a sort of a sec second world redeemer of modernity. And I think Boris was sort of getting there as well. And what is interesting is that in area studies, there's all of a sudden an interest to re-examine Yugoslavia because partly of the damage that they did in the 1990s by framing everything as ethno-nationalist tension, wars and so forth, which inevitably obviously contributed to that conflict as well. And so all of a sudden we see this uh, desire to redeem area studies from that perspective and re-examine some other more interesting histories. But I, I mean, the tendencies to find decoloniality in those studies from my perspective are obviously very limited in as much as they're still part of the epistemic infrastructures of Western Europe and knowledge production. But the question that Daniela raises, I think it's a very important one because I do think which figures we discuss and how those figures are brought into conversations around decoloniality are very important and they're not necessarily 
that's disconnected from our contemporary political realities. One example, for instance, is how today's Kosovo uh, uh, foreign minister, Donika Grvala, is the daughter of Yusuf Grvala, who is assassinated by the Yugoslav authorities in Stuttgart. And so that's, that, that, that's one way to think of what decoloniality means from a from a a Kosovo perspective, for instance, or the fact that the settler colonization of Kosovo uh, doesn't gain any traction at any given time when you think of Yugoslavia. As for Bosnia, I think it's also very interesting because, I mean, what happens to both to decolonial projects that are started uh, somewhere in the 1960s and how those decolonial projects end up and what they end up becoming in the 1990s I think it's also very interesting because they can easily turn into reactionary politics in as much as they're concerned with uh, some sort of a recovery, a pure recovery of the past that may have never been and for sure never was. And of course, we have Salafis and Wahhabis for that kind of, especially in Islamist politics. But I do think the figure of Izetbegovic for the period in which he operated under Yugoslavia is very interesting. And I think what's ha what happens after Yugoslavia is also very interesting because he, unlike Melika Salibegovic, for instance, um, decides that all of a sudden he's pro-Western, he's pro-European, and he's the president of post-war Bosnia. And his offer uh, to Melika to become minister of culture in the new post-war Bosnia government was on condition that she removes her hijab and she gives up her political alliance to pan-Islamism. So it's also very interesting to see how those projects are always very much gendered um, and how they're also related to other uh, transformative politics and who uh, sticks to the political uh, agenda and who sets it and who steps away from it. So I think they all need to be obviously critically and thoroughly uh, examined like Daniela said, from the political, from the contemporary uh, political uh, perspective, one thing that I wouldn't do is erase them naturally, because I mean their contribution, regardless of what their post-Yugoslav uh, politics may have been, their histories in Yugoslavia are also very relevant, and they tell us uh, what kind of because they tell us what kind of trajectories those kind of uh, politics of liberation can take and that they can also take reactionary trajectories. And I'll stop there because I think I've taken up more time than everybody else. Thank you. Thank you, Piro. Um, Rada, Paul. Okay. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> I should try to be telegraphic and this is very difficult uh, because I'm thinking of questions that have been raised by several people. Um, uh, Sanya, you raised the, um, the, the idea that we might want to do some research on an on alignment with uh, Indians. Let me say briefly that uh, Indians are much less interested in uh, uh, the history of uh, non-alignment. There are some people working on it uh, off and on, but not uh, so intensely. Uh, nowadays, uh, they are less interested because uh, non-alignment was never vital and crucial to India as it was uh, to Yugoslavia. To, to Yugoslavia uh, from uh, 48 on and until uh, 61 uh, in Belgrade uh, and then uh, over the 60s, it was a matter of survival. Uh, not for India. India was a local uh, uh, big power and still is an even bigger big power. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> this is one uh, question. The other uh, um, thing is that I would like to propose uh, to you people uh, um, the concept uh, it may not be uh, easily uh, uh, understood as, as useful, but I see something there, uh, something uh, like uh, self-colonization, right? So we have colonization of other continents. We know about that. Uh, that is the, the colonization we have learned about at school and so on. Uh, then we discovered uh, from uh, uh, 
decolonial scholars uh, working uh, from Latin American decolonial theory on uh, uh, Central Asian uh, uh, republics uh, uh, that have uh, come after the Soviet Union. Uh, we know from them that there is a uh, neighboring colonialism, neighboring colonialism, neighboring countries, right? And we have also uh, some kind, uh, some, some kind of, I could call it uh, self uh, colonization or, or uh, something that is and isn't uh, uh, colonization like the distant one, uh, distant colonization has been uh, very, very brutal and probably more brutal than, than uh, this smaller scale, uh, uh, if I may say smaller scale, because everything is uh, uh, relative uh, here, because uh, the, the distant colonization of other continents came also with Western modernization to those continents. And modernity was to them uh, absolutely um, brutal and violent, right? Uh, the thing is uh, ripped out here on a smaller scale, but it is there. So uh, self-colonization or something similar, maybe we shall find another term that may be useful uh, uh, for us. Uh, the other thing is that, uh, I think we want to get out of area studies and not repeat area studies. And um, um, Boris said uh, something about uh, um, um, what did you say? <laughs> I now forgot what it was. Uh, yeah, there is no subject. There is no subject, right? Uh, uh, but you don't have a subject first, and then uh, action, and then a result of an action. Uh, subjects are constructed during uh, action. Uh, that action we can follow. Uh, I can follow from here because I, I can't go into everything. Uh, as uh, uh, on the one hand, something happening in the sphere of knowledge, and also something ha something happening out there physically uh, uh, in, in a country or on a terrain. At the same time, we want to overcome the area studies and, and closing into uh, identities. Uh, so I wouldn't worry so much about uh, there being no subject because I know from Indian studies and then later from, from other uh, alternative philosophies that uh, uh, it is, you do not, uh, depoliticize a, a topic uh, when uh, you say, say or claim that there is no concept of a subject. The political subject will arise or will uh, arise or, or, or arises uh, in action. And uh, this is what I expect uh, in the future. And uh, what we meant was not, uh, we could, you could mean uh, successor countries are, as subjects, but uh, successor countries are not that, uh, we do not expect that they can bring us light as it is now to our area. But uh, um, when, we critique, when we critique the non-aligned movement, in the past, but also think about its possibilities in the future. Uh, we are actually critiquing and seeing into international relations. And we have a global thing here, and we have international uh, relations that are being reshuffled today, and that, we, that will give uh, results, political results in the future that we can't predict uh, very well uh, right now because the what is going on between the USA and, and China is really preposterous and, and uh, we can't uh, stay in, in that new binary being uh, uh, constructed. We need to go to beyond uh, that binary and any binary and we shall see which uh, subjects will come up. Thank you.
Thank you, Radha. Paul, uh, yeah. we still have a couple more, or more minutes. Okay. Uh, I, hate, it up. I mean, I'm the last one who should speak. Uh, and I am the last one who should speak. I mean, my only legitimacy would be the the karma, the karma that sticks on others uh, that Radha uh, beautifully assigned to me. But what a wonderful discussion. There are seven different channels, it seems to me, that we could have further debates around. And, you know, that 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 is what makes this so good, really. So, I, I mean, I only want to, I mean, I... I echo the area studies thing. We don't, you know, we don't want that in that kind of way. Um, and I think what a lot of the discussion reminded me of was, you know, one of the glaring contradictions for me when I started this work was the nation's, you know, this was called a movement. It created exactly the conditions for mobilities and circuits of affinity but when they met in these meetings, they all had nation state symbols in front of them, right? And that, you know, um, Vijay Prashad's notion of the second decolonial revolution in which you kind of, you know, get away from bourgeois nation state thinking for reasons that were more to do with global political economy never happened. And that that is part of the tragedy here. So, you know, Part of why I do want to work on the new international economic order is one, because it decenters Yugoslavia. Um, but secondly, because actually some of the things that Piero talked about already in the 60s, I think actually conjuncturally they come much later. Uh, or, or, or they're much louder later, really, in a sense. You know, the Yugoslavs telling people in the West that don't take the Algerians too seriously. You don't have to take the whole of the new international economic order. You can you can do bits of it, you know. So that's the first bit of the work that I want to do. But the second bit, and it is a really important moment to kind of to acknowledge that for whatever reasons, subconsciously, unconsciously, deliberately, the book reflects a Ljubljana, um, Zagreb, Belgrade axis, and actually, you know there needs to be more work which repositions and looks at different kind of positionalities. And I'll just give one example right at the end, um, demography, right? Piro, Piro's book is great about, you know, the kind of variegated demographic control of different populations. And so, you know, you might find uh, activists from Yugoslavia involved in campaigns against Malthusianism at the United Nations, but what were they doing about a neo-Malthusian policy within Macedonia and Kosovo? You know, those are kind of questions that I never, it never occurred to me two years ago, and are now kind of really quite central to what, what, I, what I'm interested in doing. So just thank you, everyone, um, and what a rich thing. And it's one of the things where you really want to re-listen re to this, um, because I'll get a lot more out of it. Um, so yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks everyone. Thank you, Paul. And uh, now for those who are interested, Arta Mustafa uh, posted his paper, uh, which is uh, extremely interesting. I just uh, went through the abstract, uh, so uh, fully recommendation to that as well. Uh, thank you for being with us today. Uh, we continue. I, I very much look forward to uh, discussing these matters again, uh, maybe on other book or soon we will have Peter's book, uh, I hope, also. And um, have a nice uh, day or have a nice evening. Goodbye. Ciao. Uh -oh.